Hello everyone, uh, I'm Wang Han from the University of Edinburgh. Welcome to the Combustion webinar. Today our speaker is Professor Andreas Dressler from TU Darmstadt. Professor Dressler is very well known in later diagnostics and combustion, so it's my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, Professor Dressler graduated from the University of Heidelberg in physics in 1992, and in 1995, he received his PhD in physical chemistry at the same university. And in 1999, he was a group leader in the EKT Institute at TU Darmstadt, working with Professor Yannicka. And in 2002, he finished his habilitation in combustion at TU Darmstadt. As you may know, the habilitation is a qualification required to obtain a professorship in Germany. In 2008, Professor Dressler was appointed as chair of the Institute Reacting Flow and Diagnostic, RSM, at TU Darmstadt. So since then, uh, at TU Darmstadt, there are two strong combustion institutes, EKT and the RSM, working on numerical and uh, experimental, respectively. Professor Dressler is the main organizer for Turbulent Non-Prenix Flame Workshop, TNL Workshop and has made a large number of substantial contribution to quantitative measurements of reacting flow. This includes the world's first measurement of hydrocarbon concentration and temperature in turbulent flames, which could only be achieved through the ingenious use of nonlinear optical effects, such as uh, uh, raman rayleigh -Really scattering, as well as the first quantitative image measurements of formaldehyde information in IC engines and the turbulent transport in flame with the help of, with the help of leaf and the high-speed cameras. His results are being used all over the world to improve combustion models. Uh, Professor Dressler has received a lot of awards and honors. Here I just want to mention a few. In, 2000, uh, in 2014, he was awarded the prestigious uh, Lebanese Prize. Uh, I think this is the highest award in, in Germany for researchers. Uh, two years ago, he was elected as fellow of International Combustion uh, Institute. Also, he was an invited lecturer for Princeton and the Tsinghua Combustion Summer School. Today, his talk title is uh, Laser Diagnostic in Combustion. And uh, so during the talk, audience can send your questions to chat channel or Q&A channel. I will collect the question and ask on, the, uh, on behalf of you in the end of the talk. And uh, after the question, uh, we will allow everyone to turn on the radio and the microphone to say hi and thanks to the speaker. So Professor uh, Drisler, you can start. Okay, Wang Han, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And as well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me giving this talk uh, on laser diagnostics and combustion. I think it's a Great idea to have this webinar to stay in contact in these uh, strange and difficult times. So um, my intention today is that I give you some insight and overview of laser diagnostics uh, applied in combustion systems. So with that, I would like to show the areas where we can make use of those uh, methodologies. It is not my intention that we go into depth of spectroscopy or going into depth of the combustion systems where we apply these diagnostics to. So when we look into the motivation and the drivers for our research, I think at least that um, one of the drivers is uh, this, the global warming, where combustion of fossil fuels actually is, is uh, one of the great, let's say, uh, uh, problems. However, if you look into the solution, I think combustion technology is as well part of the solution. And I would like to make two statements to underline that. The first statement is that to, at least my strong belief is that a synthetic, specifically synthetic chemical energy carriers are essential. And they are essential to bridge the gap in time and space between on the one hand, cost effective production of sustainable energies and power demand. And this is because chemical energy carriers, which is shown here in this simple graph, do have not only a highest storage capacity, but as well the highest withdrawal rates compared to other energy carriers, which are much less in capacity and withdrawal rate. So that's the first statement. The second statement is 
that I think once you have these synthetic chemical energy carriers, of course, you would have two ways to, to turn them back to electricity or mechanical energy or uh, end energy, let's say. But um, from these two ways, electrochemistry is one and the other one is combustion. And I think that at least for a transition period that may last decades, um, combustion technologies specifically operated with synthetic fuels are irreplaceable. And they can be e either CO2 neutral or CO2 free, for example, if you operate these systems with hydrogen. And because at least in Germany, um, our area is, is under debate, let's say, we have uh, started to write an opinion paper here, my co-authors, Christoph Schulz, Hans Pitsch and Johannes Janneke, um, with a, let's say, opinion paper stating the, um, the importance of uh, chemical energy carriers and the importance of combustion technology. And we will make this as well available in English and you might be interested to read our perspective. However, coming back to this statement number two, when we think that combustion technology is specifically operated uh, to be more uh, CO2 neutral or even CO2 free, we need combustion research. So this is the starting point and motivation uh, for, for what I'm doing here. If you now look into the primary targets of, of combustion research, we do have different ones. One is a classical, it's about efficiency. That's clear. The higher the efficiency overall, the less um, CO2 would be emitted in case of fossil fuels or the less costly synthetic fuel is necessary for your uh, device. The second primary target is stability. We have to improve it, for example, in auto engines uh, to reduce cycling variations or in gas turbines to prevent lean blow off or flashback. The third target is about pollutant emissions. So we have to reduce them further to fulfill as well uh, more and more stringent legislation by primary measures inside the combustor and by secondary measures by catalytic converters. And the fourth one is about flexibility. So here, specifically for power generation from sustainable uh, energies like wind and solar, we need to balance them. And that can be done, for example, by gas turbines. And we need flexibility in terms of fuels because we can expect there will be in future a higher diversity in e-fuels, biofuels, and fuel blends. And so this is um, what the, let's say, the, the targets are. And in this area, most of us do their research in, in combustion. Like in other communities, we follow um, an approach which is based on experiments, of course, strongly interlinked to theory, from which we try to deduce mathematical models, which are accurate, physically accurate, that can then be implemented in, into numerical simulation. And here numerical simulation as something like a third wing of science interconnects experiments and modeling from these uh, two perspectives. However, I think as well, very important for us is that we try to transfer our knowledge, our methodologies uh, into industry to really uh, enable uh, a more CO2 neutral future um, in the, in the uh, forthcoming decades. In my talk, I will concentrate primarily on the experiments and it will have some aspects about transfer to industry. Okay, if you perform experiments in combustion, you need two ingredients. One is a setup, which depends on the purpose. It can be canonical, it can be a benchmark system or even a real world system. Then, on the other hand, you need, as a second ingredient, a measurement technique that can be easily classified, for example, in being extractive and in situ. And I will concentrate here in my talk only on in situ techniques, which is laser diagnost diagnostics and combustion. I think um, it is still so specific or so special because you can measure without or only minimally in, in being intrusive, so you do not disturb the flow and you achieve highest temporal resolution and very good spatial resolution. And uh, these techniques we apply since a number of years in different environments, as you see from this photo gallery here from my lab. Okay, so I will concentrate as said on this one specific aspect, this in situ measurements. Here again, if you dig the next step into where these techniques can be applied, we can distinguish four areas. One area is about understanding phenomena. Here, you typically work with canonical configurations. And those can be 
let's say, transferred as well into benchmark systems where you have to control the boundary conditions to perform validation experiments to support numerical model. And here, typically, at least in, in my strategy I'm following, we try to go from simple to complex. So perform or design the benchmark experiment as simple as possible to really um, extract the phenomenon you are in mostly interested. However, sometimes um, you want to investigate interlinked processes like here with the solid fuel combustion, there already your benchmark does have a certain level of complexity. Then as a third field, we have to adapt and transfer our measurement techniques to be applicable in real world systems. And um, this typically comes along with the fact that still you need some expert knowledge to use that. That's why I think there is a fourth area, which is quite interesting and highly important, which I call robust sensing. Here, the idea is that we, uh, let's say, come up with sensors that can be used as well with people that need not to be trained that highly as being combustion engineers. And thereby as well, we support technology development by application of the systems in real world. And these four areas, they span um, let's say the, 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 the talk I want to give. So I will talk about examples of phenomena validation, technology development and robust sensing. With that, I would like to start with phenomena where we are using typically canonical configurations and uh, try to support our physical chemical understanding of the processes. And I've selected here solid fuel combustion. Um, it could be biomass, it could be coal. Uh, the example I've chosen is coal. And uh, the phenoma, phenomena we are looking at now as an example is uh, the transition from single particle combustion to particle group combustion. So this is ongoing work and here are some related papers that have been submitted and hopefully will be published soon. So the work has been done by my PhD students Tao Li and Chris Geschwindner. Uh, last year, Dr. Köser graduated on this area, on this field of uh, research, and Dr. Böhm and myself are supervising this work. We are working closely as well with partners like uh, Dr. Schiemann from Bochum, and everything is uh, financed by the German Research Foundation in a so-called collaborative research center, which is about oxyflame combustion. Okay, so for those who are not so familiar uh, with this uh, type of uh, combustion in, in solid fuels, I have here uh, a chart showing uh, the temperature over time history. So when we inject particles first, they dry and emit uh, water vapor. After drying, eventually these particles might swell, followed by pyrolysis, where you do have here um, volatiles like a CH4, H2, but as well tars that might ignite in this hot gas environment, and then a form of volatile uh, uh, combustion uh, phase, which is homogeneous in nature. After volatile combustion, uh, the, the particle might switch to uh, char combustion, which is heterogeneous in nature. And then uh, after these uh, C uh, atoms are consumed, you um, end with ash. So what we are looking at now is uh, the early phase up to the volatile combustion. So the idea is, as I already said, we want to better understand how uh, the flame structure changes if you go from a single particle to group combustion. And so overall, of course, this is a 3D problem. You, we are facing diverse sizes and shapes from these particles. We are looking into particle-particle interactions. And uh, with that, of course, um, having said, um, we, we might as well observe different flame structures. And looking into these problems, we have developed over the past years high-speed imaging and extended that to volumetric imaging. And I'm going to show um, how we can apply these techniques to this uh, interesting and challenging uh, combustion phenomenon. So we, we look into a laminar flow reactor, which is shown over here. So to uh, create a hot atmosphere, we have here a flat flame, which is stabilized on top of this ceramic honeycomb which is operated with methane and then, for example, an oxyflame atmosphere. The important aspect is we use a lean environment such that we have excess oxygen. So in this area, it's not only hot, but as well, you have oxygen for oxidizing particles, which are injected here along this tube, typically two millimeters in diameter. And the carrier gas typically is the same as used to support this flat flame. And then we have optical access to this uh, flow reactor from all sides and uh, because of these fused silica windows. 
So we characterize the boundary conditions quite well. So we know the wall temperature, the gas temperature, gas velocity, flame front position, to name the most important one, the most important ones. And then we can study now parametrically what actually happens uh, when we inject different particles at different atmospheres. From this large data set, I have uh, selected one example where actually it's not an oxy fuel atmosphere, it's an O2 N2 atmosphere, but this is uh, not so important for what we are looking at. For the case um, to be shown, there is 20% excess oxygen, and we have selected here columbian bituminous coal with a size in the order of 100 microns. So we want to perform 3D measurements. So we want to understand the 3D appearance of the flame structure. And so we do that by OH LIF, but in quasi 3D by having a 2D slice, which we scan rapidly back and forth. And this scanning of this UV laser that excites the OH around 283 nanometers, we use an acousto-optic deflector, AOD. This is a crystal which is operated here, or excited, I should better say, by a supersonic wave. And then you create this acoustic wave. In physics, these are phonons. They interact with the photons, and thereby you can steer the beam in a certain range of angles. And this can be done very rapidly. If the laser is now operated with 10 kilohertz, within something like one millisecond, we can make a sweep and then have 10 adjacent planes, because by this lens, we again uh, parallelize these laser sheets. And so we have 10 planes from which we can reconstruct the 3D appearance. And uh, this is done uh, by linear interpolation. In the end, we end up with voxel sizes of 25 microns, which are then further on filtered by uh, a Gaussian filter. But uh, this is already maybe a, a, a too, too, too detailed. So you see here the setup. This is our 10 kilohertz dye laser system that is going through this AOD, creating here the light sheet, which is scanned back and forth uh, with, within four millimeters, which is still in the uh, field of view um, of these, um, or it's still in focus of these um, camera, image intensified camera equipped with this microscope here. And in addition to that, we have here an DBI that stands for diffuse backlight illumination, based operated with this LED, and then you just observe the shadow graph uh, um, with high magnification by the second camera. And then a third camera looks for luminosity, primarily for thermal radiation uh, and the transition from the volatile to the char combustion. And so for today, we're looking into ignition, volatile combustion, flame topology, and number density. So we skip the other information. Okay, to give you an idea, here is an individual sequence of a single particle combustion. And what you see is the reconstructed shape of the volatile flame visualized by this quasi 3D OH lift. And so you see here from this single sequence, um, ignition was at T0, then after three, four, up to 10 millisecond actually what happens. And um, the intensity here is normalized. Uh, and uh, you see here a certain cut through this 3D flame ball. And to better show that, uh, we take maybe this nine milliseconds as an example, where you once again see this reconstruction with these ISO contours of the OH and with the uh, particle being here at the center. If you take the central slice, which actually uh, collides with the particle, then you see downstream of the particle, there is a shadow because the UV laser light has been absorbed by the particle at this position. And so maybe by that, you have an idea what kind of data we have. Now, what we can, can we do with that? We can take this hemisphere, which is not affected by this shadow over here. So we take only the left hemisphere and we integrate along the radius. And thereby we receive something like a normalized intensity over the radius. Here would be at zero would be the particle. Uh, this line over here would be the background of OH that comes from the flat flame. And if we do have ignition at this instant, it's the first time where the OH craze is uh, uh, larger than the background. And so we can now measure this intensity over here, which is shown to the right graph, the maximum OH intensity. And we can as well measure the radial position, which is this red line over here. If you now, after ignition, follow the volatile combustion, we see that there is a volatile flame getting more and more intense. And after four milliseconds or so, the radial position is constant. So we reach here, at least in terms of spatial position, steady state, but it's getting still more intense. And then afterwards, we pass maximum, and then the volatile combustion at some time come to an end. 
So we do have here a main reaction zone close to the particle and an exhaust gas dominated zone further away. Let's have a look into the diffuse backlight illumination. We can uh, follow here the particles uh, again as well. You see nicely how the particles rotate. You see as well that they form something like candle-like uh, uh, areas where you see soot. And of course, you can change the particle number density, so the particle load. This would be here at low load. However, you can increase the load and thereby decrease the particle-particle distance. Yeah? And if you now take a certain field of view, uh, you count over a certain time the particles, and then you end up with something like a histogram coming up with three different scenarios, low, middle, and high number densities. Um, and therefore, we want to understand how the flame structure changes. And this is shown over here. For low particle number density, you see here uh, a cut through the 3D appearance. If we focus in, you see that at these low particle number densities, the particle-particle distance is in the order of a millimeter or more. We do have nearly spherical flames, and ignition and volatile combustion is actually separated spatially. But the burnt gas region, uh, that is interlinked. And that becomes to be different if you now increase the particle number density, now by a factor of two. You see that the particle distance uh, typically is now below a millimeter, and if you go into the focus here, it's not so obvious that you have the same flame shape around this uh, cold particles. They're not, not spherical anymore. And in the center, here's the central axis. There, the um, conditions are already starting to be fuel rich. Thereby, you do have extinction. There is no uh, chemical reaction, or at least not, nothing what produces OH. And from the DBI, we observe as well suit, and thereby laser absorption is as well uh, um, yeah, observed, and this is uh, why we have here at this branch lower OH intensities. And then going, and here maybe as well, the particle-particle the -particle distance becomes smaller and the suit areas become larger. If you now increase the particle number density by a factor of four, the particle-particle distance has decreased to typically below a half millimeter, and now you see something which is very similar to a non premix jet flame with a certain lift of height, and an area where you have no uh, OH produced at all, a central region which is very fuel rich and uh, not too much oxygen is my guess. And um, you observe as well very strong laser absorption because the suit is now even uh, stronger around these particles. And with that, I've shown you an example where by this volumetric imaging and the combination from different techniques, we can study the different um, scenarios that might happen as well in a, in a real combustor, from single particle combustion to group combustion. And that is an ongoing work, as I said, and um, we try currently, or we have done so already, to quantify this transition by certain uh, characteristic numbers, and Tao Li will hopefully uh, present the results at the forthcoming symposium. As well, so far we have had a situation where the slip velocity between the particle and the surrounding gas phase was small. Of course, that limits transport, transport of heat and, and, and species, for example. And therefore, we want to change that by injecting particles as well into a turbine flow and thereby influence the transport. And for that, some years ago, we have built up uh, a plasma heater that allows us um, to create a very hot flow of oxidizer emanating from this nozzle over here um, at very high temperatures. And to that, we can coaxially inject particles. In the, in, the, in, the, in the past, we have done primarily with gaseous fuels, but this has been switched by Chris Schwindner now as well to particles, such that we can investigate order ignition or ignition of particles and uh, particle combustion in, in these kind of, let's say, uh, situations where you have a changed transport. And as well, we go further to realistic systems, as I said, from simple to complex. Now we added the complexity that uh, we are going towards real coal combustion, so far primarily focused on gas-assisted solid fuel combustion, where we have used here a production type nozzle similar to what is used in furnaces, with this typical qual followed by a dump plane and then the combustor. But the speciality you see over here, everything is optically transparent. And thereby, we have looked into the stabilization zone of these flames. And you, if you're interested in that, you're invited to, to look at our papers. 
With that, I would like to close this chapter and come to the next one. It's about the step into the validation, where, as I said, we need benchmarks with well-defined boundary conditions. And the example I'm going to show is about diffusion cooling, which actually is already quite a complex case. And so far, uh, the validation uh, data has not been used so extensively. However, it's a very interesting experiment. That's why I'd like to share it with you. Before we go to that, let's have a closer look into how we make use of the experiments here, not only to understand phenomena, and now as well, it's really aiming for supporting model development and validation of the complete numerical simulation of the system. Of course, at low Reynolds numbers, this is as well supported by DNS, but the case I'm going to show, you have no chance with, with DNS. And then, of course, uh, we are closely collaborating with people on the scale resolving simulation like LES, which is then used to develop technology, but it's as well used to improve our understanding and thereby we trigger it again new ideas for experiments. So let's have a look into the progression of benchmarks. When I started with this business, 30 years ago nearly, uh, the, the simulation were dominated by ranks. By that time, at the end of the 90s, the TNF workshop has been established. We started to look to, into simple jet flames or piloted flames. So here are some of the typical TNF flames uh, shown as, as photos. Then with the advent of low resolution LAS, maybe 20 years ago, it became possible as well to come up with more reliable simulations of more complex flow fields like in bluff bodies or swirls. Nowadays, we're looking into multi regime combustion, which as well is from, from the simulation side, the combustion model is quite, quite complex. But with the advent of uh, even more computation facilities, we are now in the area of high resolution LAS, where the uh, geometries are become more and more complex. Looking into the implications for diagnostics, we started with single point statistics like laser Doppler velocimetry and complemented that already in the early days by Raman and Riley scattering, uh, particularly in the Sandia National Labs. Then with low resolution LAS, we added specifically two point statistics and scalar gradients. For example, here 1D measurements in these kind of flows. And then with the advent of high resolution LAS, as well in diagnostics, we, we uh, progressed and added multi-parameter measurements from flow and scalar fields. We looked into dynamics and transients and added volumetric imaging. And here you see as well another example of our volumetric imaging, where we looked into this autoignition from eight camera perspectives. So quite challenging experiments. With that having said, I would like to switch now to the example which is a fusion cooling. Uh, the PhD candidate working on that is Max Greifenstein, who is supervised by Dr. Böhm and myself. And this um, work is funded as well by the German Research Foundation. And related papers, if you're interested, have been published last year. Let's have a look into our model combustor. Um, it allows us to operate the combustion air in this flame tube up to 680K. And the maximum is 10 bar with a certain mass flow rate that is as well limited to our compressor. And um, in this model is set up for the examples to be shown, we have looked into uh, uh, globally lean um, uh, combustion, either without any pilot or a piloted case. And the speciality was that we can change the swirl number during operation. And this is done by a movable block design, which uh, will be magnified in the second, uh, in the next slide. So, we have here the preheated uh, air inflow. So this comes from the compressor, electrically preheated. Then we do have here uh, the um, jet and across flow mixing from our natural gas or methane. Uh, then we do have here our movable block design. Uh, this is a, the swirler. And then you have here an annular gap and a mixing pipe for further pre-mixing. Uh, and then uh, eventually, if you want to have as well here centrally in the bluff body, which is shown in, in yellow, there we can inject as well fuel as a pilot. So this um, um, nozzle is installed to this flame tube shown in red. Uh, it's here 100 by 100 millimeters, 180 millimeters long. It does have a contraction nozzle, which is as well here water cooled. We have optical access from two sides horizontally and from top. And in the bottom, you see now our effusion cooling plate. So this is here, the region of interest. And here is uh, an own design. This is not commercial. That's why I'm allowed to show it. Uh, we have here in our case, 145 holes in 13 rows. 
And the diameter of these holes here is two millimeters and they're inclined by 30 degrees. And they have a certain spacing and then overall the porosity is 4%. So I I've now selected one um, a certain condition where the combustion air was 623K and the cooling air, which can be controlled independently, was as well 623K. The system was operated at two and a half bar um, and overall lean, either um, with or without pilot. So this case, lean premix is without pilot. And uh, with a, uh, the other case, there 10% of the fuel was injected centrally through this um, jet in the center. And the swirl numbers we're looking at have been varied between 0.7 and 1.3. And the mass flow of the cooling air has been changed from 7.5 grams to 15 grams per second. And we looked into the flow field by PIV, flame structures, gas temperatures, and as well, wall temperatures for which we developed phosphor thermometry. To start with, I would like to show here typical, let's say, um, uh, insights into the near wall region. So for your orientation, the flow comes from left to right. This is the effusion cooling plate and we look here at two holes. And what you see is um, relative OH distributions. And we do have different typical scenarios. One scenario is that um, the uh, uh, unburned gases from the nozzle, they, they are not always separated from the effusion gas and thereby um, you might have dilution um, by cooling air prior to combustion. Another scenario might be that um, these uh, flows from adjacent holes combine and thereby you see strongly varying angles of the effusion cooling jets. And in some other cases, there will be as well even no penetration of the cooling air as shown here, and thereby the cooling efficiency is decreased tremendously. Let's have a look into the flow field. I show only the mean flow field for a certain example with a high flow rate of the uh, cooling air and the small flow rate of the cooling air. And you see here how these jets leave the, these, these holes and interact with the bulk flow. At the high flow rate with 15 grams per second, this penetrates something like two and a half millimeters. However, this is decreased to uh, something like one millimeter if you have the low flow rate. And you see as well in the second hole over here, this uh, flow is more or less completely blocked um, and thereby the cooling efficiency will be strongly affected. Looking at the gas temperatures, we have done that in certain areas in the, in the combustor. However, the closest position to the wall was half a millimeter on top of that. And this was done by cars point wise. And then we can reconstruct uh, the mean um, temperature field. And so the flow in this perspective is from bottom to top, uh, again, with the first and the second hole shown for a high flow rate of the cooling air and small flow rate. And here you see the color code of the temperature and you see quite nicely that with a high flow rate, you have a larger area where you have relatively low temperatures around 800 or 900 K, which is distantly smaller for the small flow rate. And looking in the uh, probabilities to find temperatures, uh, for this case, with 15 grams per second, you have a monomodal distribution, whereas uh, for the low flow rate, you have a bimodal distribution, which means that in this case, uh, all the uh, realizations have been uh, all within the flow of um, the effusion cooling here, whereas here, you sometimes switch as well into areas where, or situations where it's completely burned gases in your measurement volume. And this is reflected as well in the wall temperatures measured by thermographic phosphorus, yak or europium we have used, where for the high flow rate, you find this flow come from left to right, uh, small temperatures around uh, something like 1050 K here, and even colder downstream. And for the low flow rate, you find uh, 50 to 100 K higher temperatures. And if you can increase swirl from 0.7 to 1.3, the, the upstream uh, positions of the wall are getting even hotter uh, and above 1200 K. And with this information, we can now quantify the so-called total cooling efficiency. And this is defined, this is a number between zero and one, and is defined by the temperature in the bulk. T infinity is the temperature in our case along the axial coordinate of the combustor. The cooling air temperature is uh, the 623K that goes into the cooling plate. And the wall temperature is actually what we measured. And so if the wall temperature would be the cooling temperature, this quantity would be one and you would have a perfect cooling efficiency. However, 
the wall temperature is typically uh, hotter than the cooling air and thereby the cooling efficiency is below one. And you see here the cases for the high and the low flow rate and here uh, for the axial position and for increasing swirl. And what we observe is that higher flow rates in the effusion cooling means that the cooling efficiency is better if you compare these numbers. We observe secondly that swirl uh, causes higher wall temperatures and reduces the cooling efficiency. And interestingly downstream, the effect of swirl and the flow rate uh, vanishes. And so I think this is now a case with very well defined boundary conditions and would be nicely uh, suited for validation, however, um, already a very complex uh, case. With that, I would like again switch gears and come now to the third chapter, technology development, where our idea is to adapt and transfer our methods into real world geometries. And this is done by a PhD finishing this year, Christian Fach, again supervised by Benjamin and myself. And this is a collaboration with the Daimler uh, company uh, not far from here. And here, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Krüger are our collaboration partners. And I've selected an example where we have developed an endoscope uh, to look into real IC engines. And the idea is here to look into transient operations because those are interesting because here pollutant emissions are increasing tremendously. And this is as well true for suit. And of course, an engine manufacturer like Daimler wants to reduce primary particle formation. And to better understand what's going on in the engine, we performed multi-parameter imaging, but with an endoscope and thereby operating with a real engine. And so the real engine is a one cylinder production type geometry. It's unmodified with regard to piston and piston rings. It's lubricated with oil. And this is already very different to typical transparent engines we have in our lab, for example. Um, the liner here is equipped uh, with um, a sapphire window, 70 millimeters tall, but just a few millimeters wide. And this means that the, the piston rings, they go over it uh, and um, uh, we, we have almost no impact on the thermal boundary conditions. The endoscopic excess over here is 12 millimeter wide. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to share all the details about it. The engine is operated with gasoline um, uh, from a typical E10 fuel, and here are some more engine parameters. So the optical setups shown down here, what we did is high-speed PIV, so we coupled in a laser light going here through the central tumble plane, and then with its endoscope equipped with two cameras, one camera was looking then for the PIV. And another one was a color imaging camera as well at high speed that looked for spray imaging, flame propagation by blue chemiluminescence and suit luminosity. And this is shown over here. Of course, um, you do have a distorted uh, look into this engine. So these are 50 by 50 millimeters. Um, you see here the exhaust valves, here would be the intake valves, here's the spark plug, and here is the piston. Reflections like here and here are unavoidable, but we can, we can uh, uh, work with them using a very thin laser sheet. However, overall, the contrast is not as good as in the engine with full optical excess. However, it is close to production. So we performed now these endoscopic PIV using oil seeding, and that works quite nicely. And to show you again for a stationary operation condition, you see here uh, phase average PIV during intake. Uh, here you see the crank angle. This is uh, um, now you see how a tumble forms, and now the intake valve closes, and uh, you do have a, a tumble formation uh, finished. And this is now pushed in in direction of the cylinder head. And in a second, you will see how the piston comes with its real geometry as uh, from production type. So by that, we do have now instruments to look into these kind of engines. And now we um, uh, look into transients. And we look now here into one example, which is called tip-in. A tip-in maneuver is a load step starting from motor operation, and then you, and then you uh, increase the load. And we do that by constant engine speed of uh, 1400 RPM with a certain control strategy of the engine. I have no time to go into detail. However, we benchmark that against a four-cylinder engine. 
Here you see the IMEP, the P intake pressure, the valve timing and the particle number density from a, a production engine as it comes uh, from, from the factory. And then uh, with this, our endoscopic engine, we manipulate it now and control the intake pressure such that IMAP intake pressure, valve timing are identical shown by these residuals. They're almost uh, perfect. But the particle number density, of course, there is some deviation because we have a single cylinder engine. However, with that, we have launched a system that allows us to investigate the cause and effect chains uh, to reduce sewage emissions specifically in the context of real driving emissions. This is a big topic here. And so because of restricted time, I will look into only one cycle during this transient. So this tip in starts somewhere here and over here. This goes over more than 30 cycles. And I selected here a cycle uh, from the center with 2.65 uh, bars. And we measured now multi parameters already stated, the insulin flow, spray, combustion, suit formation. And um, I will give you here the, uh, yeah, some insight into the data. These are single realizations of the flow field for this individual cycle with different crank angles here during the intake phase and then later on during the compression phase. And these can be now correlated to what happens later on. So what happens is now that we can look into spray. Here you see from this specific cycle, how the spray interacts with a, with a piston over here. It's an early uh, injection, um, but you have strong uh, interaction with the piston wall, with splashing and all the phenomena. Then this is the crank angle. And then we make a jump. Now we are uh, uh, close um, or after, after ignition. Here you see now how this flame first bluish stabilizes and propagates and then suit is formed in the gas phase. And then eventually the flame uh, interacts with the walls and thereby you find now here pool fires. And this kind of data is now used to understand parametric sensitivities to prevent furthermost these events even during transient operation. And with that having said, um, we have developed a tool that allows us to investigate these cause and effect chains uh, here for this example of suit formation. And this brings me to my last uh, chapter about robust sensing. So this endoscope you have seen is still a very complex um, measurement uh, technique. And the idea of course is in future to transfer this methodology as well into application without this expert knowledge. And we stay with real driving emissions and I will show you a recent development of an in situ exhaust gas sensor developed in the group of Dr. Wagner. He's uh, with this uh, group high temperature process diagnostics who is part of my institute, Dr. Diemel, who graduated last year, and Luigi Biondo, who is the current PhD working on that. And this work is uh, supported by a local uh, foundation, and again, the German Research Foundation. So again, it's about real driving emissions. We want, it, want to measure and later maybe control the real polluted emissions during as well transient operation. And for that, we want to measure the exact gas composition, yeah, shown over here consisting of many different molecules and changing temperature. And for that, we need a robust multi-species diagnostic method. And for that, we use tunable diet laser absorption spectroscopy. So in principle, and a very simple idea, you have here the laser launched um, or fiber coupled, here you launch it, then you have a certain absorption path that can be as well folded to increase the path length. And then you, uh, monitor the remaining intensity, which has not been absorbed here, and this is then detected. And to visualize what's actually happening, you see here an example of water, where here's the laser shown in red. If you now uh, operate the laser and increase the laser current, you change the wavelength and the laser intensity. So this is the characteristic specification or the characteristic of this uh, diet laser. And if you now pass, uh, an absorption line like here from water, you find here this absorption feature. You can flip it. You can um, use the ideal gas law um, in connection with the temperature, which we deduce from Boltzmann fractions with a measured pressure, with a known absorption length, and the transition strength, a spectroscopic uh, information we need. Then we can, uh, by integration of this feature shown in this integral here, we can deduce the concentration.
And this is done now in a, in a highly integrated multi-pass absorption cell in our example, where we measure water because from that we deduce the uh, pass average temperature. And this is done in the near infrared. Then we measure simultaneously CO and CO2, again in the double pass manner at 2.3 and 2 microns. And then as well NO and NO2, which is here in the mid-infrared. And because of the low concentrations of these uh, um, species, we, we perform these measurements with a white cell. So there's a white cell included into this uh, sensor, which has here in the order of 50 to 60 millimeters diameter. So, which means uh, summarizing that up, it's four optical channels, all fiber coupled. Resolution is high enough to really follow transients. We can install the system as well, not only end of pipe, but as well close to the engine. And because uh, 800 K of water temperature is okay. And I've already talked about uh, the idea increasing the absorption length by a white cell. However, for the strongly absorbing species, a double pass uh, turned out to be okay. And here you see once again, the construction around uh, this module that is then very compact and robust. And we have extended that already in the, in the time to other species that are of high interest to us. But this is not published yet. However, for real driving emissions, we tested that system here on a car of um, uh, one of my PhD, former PhD students. You see here in this close up how this um, sensor has been installed. Uh, it's uh, coupled with these fibers, uh, uh, with the electronics, which is inside. It's, it's very small. Stephen Wagner and his group as well work to reduce the size of the electronics. We track as well other parameters like position and environmental data. We have as well access to the Canvas interface and thereby can link it to, to the engine control. However, to give you some insight about the capabilities, uh, I have chosen here a different example where we used our sensor uh, in comparison to a reference system. This is, product, uh, this is commercially available from ABL. It's a mobile exhaust gas analyzer, okay? And we tested it in a two liter engine EU5 in a uh, neighboring institute where they have nice uh, test benches. And we, we um, uh, uh, compared the performance in the, in the uh, VLTP cycle. Where you see here the velocity, sorry, this is in German, over time. And we are concentrating here on a certain, let's say, uh, interval within this uh, uh, test cycle. And what you see here as an example is the NO concentration and the CO concentration over time. In the back, in light gray, you see the velocity. In uh, red, you see uh, the information from the commercial instrument, which is extractive. It's not measuring in situ like our TDL sensor, which uh, pre performs quite nicely because you see here in stationary conditions, uh, zero velocity, both sensors give the same information, the same concentration, CO, NO as an example. However, if we go into transients, you see that the extractive technique as expected does have a low pass filtering characteristics. So the high spikes here are even more pronounced for CO are not resolved by the extractive measurement. And so this is by the measurement principle. And that is why it's quite clear if you want to accurately measure what is happening during transient, you need the high temporal resolution. You have to be in situ. And with that sensor, I think we did make some progress to uh, have a really robust system, which is currently uh, maybe will be commercialized. With that, I'm close to the end of my lecture. So I was talking about different areas where laser diagnostics can be used to uh, combustion problems. And those have been linked to understanding phenomena, providing validation data, providing tools that allow technology development and do that even with robust sensing. And here again are the sponsors of our work and I'm very grateful for their continuing support. With that, I would like to thank not only you for your kind attention, I would like to thank my whole group. You see here during a seminar week in the Alps, where we now have a nice house of Theo Darmstadt. However, I would not like to end before I have announced um, a summer school, which has been postponed to next year, where with the support of the Combustion Institute, um, we have a topic on near wall reactive flows, June next year, with a number of distinguished speakers. With that, 
thank you very much for your interest, for your time and attention, and I'm welcoming any, any questions you may have. Thank you, Professor Drisler. Uh, so far, I received three questions from the audience, and uh, I will ask you on, be, on, on their behalf. So the first question is from Pei Fang Fu, is about how to determine the temperature of burning char particles. Okay, this can be done by a thermography of the surface. So the, the hot surface of a particle emits, and then um, you can, at least by two color pyrometry, determine the temperature of the particle. However, this will be possible only um, above a certain temperature threshold, because if the particle is too uh, cold, the uh, emission will be too small to be detected. Okay. So the second question is from MHB, and the question is, can you give some comments about the diagnostic approach for med uh, measurement of flame extinction? Okay. Um, extinction from, it depends now on which situation you are. Let's say if you're in a, in a to make it easy, flame extinction in a, in a gaseous combustion environment. So a single phase, let's say. If you do have here, um, like in the Sandia uh, flame series, uh, Sandia A to F flames, the flame E and F are already showing some extinction. And um, here, um, extinction can be measured by laser diagnostics, ideally by looking for species which are uh, correlating the chemical activity. So perfect candidates would be CHO. CHO is not easy to be detected uh, spectroscopically. That is why other uh, species, for example, like CH or formaldehyde, have been used and might be the best, the better, let's say, markers uh, showing extinction. Uh, OH, as an example, is not a good marker because OH would be present even after a flame has been extinguished, because you have OH in the chemical equilibrium uh, in the equilibrium where you have hot environment with water vapor, you would have as well OH. Mm -hmm. So does that answer the question? Otherwise, uh, the person might ask again. Mm -hmm. Okay, the third question is from Junxia. And the question is about for the cold particle burner with particle group combustion. So what are the main parameters, including instantaneous and the mean available to model? So the, the main parameters uh, in terms of diagnostics are the boundary conditions. So we have characterized the, uh, the laminar flow reactor. So we measured the temperature actually by cars. We measured uh, the wall temperatures such that you know it well about the, um, the boundary, the thermal boundary conditions. Um, we we uh, have all the information about the flat flame going into the system. It is... Um, uh, as well uh, slightly lifted, so the, the um, ceramic flame holder stays more or less cold, so we know about, about um, let's say, the entropy flows, and the main parameters that have been changed are the gas atmosphere, so there are situations where we operated the system with air, but excess oxygen, and then typically values of 10%, 20% excess oxygen in the, in the hot gas, and we operated as well with O2 and CO2 to have an oxy flame environment. Then we changed the solid fuel. So different types of coals, different sizes, different fractions that are sieved. And uh, we looked, uh, or we, 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 we restricted ourselves primarily to the, to the end of the volatile combustion. I hope this answers the question. Um, the data are available uh, to a certain extent and they're available upon request. Okay, well, good. Uh, this is a dream. I asked the, the question. So, so what, you, what you have talked about are the boundary conditions, initial conditions. I understand that. So what, I'm, what I try to know is uh, uh, what the uh, measurement data, what measure the data available okay. for us to compare or uh, validate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the clarification. So what we do have is um, the, the particle topology. So the single particles are projected and with the high spatial resolution. So we have their shape and we have their corresponding uh, diameter. 
Um, we do have information about the flame structure, as, as, as said, starting from, from ignition, volatile combustion up to the end. And we have uh, particle velocities and uh, what, what I missed, the, the, uh, the particle particle distances. Uh, yeah, maybe I have to go into my slides again to be sure that I don't miss anything. But these are the primary parameters, yeah. So topology of the, uh, about the topology of particles, dynamics of particles and combustion properties. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Yi Hua Ren from Aachen University. And his question is about the 3D OH leaf of particle combustion on the flat flame burner. In the first demonstration of three-dimensional OH leaf signal, he noticed that the structure is asymmetric with a slight slip. And is that caused by the laser beam? Yes. Can you give some comments? Yes, yeah, sure. So Imagine that you here, have here the particle and the laser sheet comes from here and you are looking at a slice where the laser hits the particle. Let's say uh, the particle is hidden uh, centrally, then most of the laser beam is absorbed by the particle itself. And thereby, there is no light remaining downstream of the particle to excite fluorescence. And that is why you have uh, these uh, structures where no OH lift uh, appears. To circumvent that, you would have to shine in a laser from two sides, but this is not so important, I would say. So we know what is actually happening. And this is something like a, a shadowing. But there is as well other types of asymmetry because you do have a slip between the particle and the gas phase. And by buoyancy effects, in addition, uh, it's not a perfectly spherical flame, but it's slightly extended in downstream direction. And this is due to the, uh, yeah, well, uh, thermal, conditions you have as well as maybe sometimes you might have volatile release, which is not isotropically, it might release preferred into one direction. And that's why individual particles appear to have flame shapes, which are, the, that are not perfectly spherical. Okay. Uh, next question is from Madis Kohate. And his question is regarding exhaust management. And he said the conventional method sometimes produces broader profile. If you compare integrated error and peaks, is there much difference? Yes. Still you miss the peak values? Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Of course, we looked into that. In the end, for a certification, you have the cumulated mass of, let's say, NO or CO. If you go through this cycle uh, for this specific engine, and for this specific analyzer from AVL, the difference was uh, in the order of 10%. So okay. if you have certified your engine very close to the threshold where it's allowed, and then switch the sensors, you might come into an area where it's not allowed anymore. And so um, the integrated uh, mass is different. OK. Uh, since time is up, I, I will ask uh, one question, one last question from panel. It's Dom Yang from Imperial College. He has two questions for the wall cooled combustor. The first question is what's the resolution of temperature measurements in Kelvin? How close to the wall and how fast can the dynamic temperature perturbation be measured? Okay. Um, the, the, I'm not sure whether I, I, I answered now that in the correct direction. So first of all, I, I read here as well this, this question. So what you can do is um, we measure by coherent anti-Stokes Raman spectroscopy, the gas temperature as close in the case I've shown half a millimeter in top of the wall. In other, in other setups, we can go even down to 50 microns. It depends on the topology of the wall, how close we can get. So in this flat, um, the fusion cooling plate, it was half a millimeter we could afford. Each temperature measurement lasts eight nanoseconds or six nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. So it's more or less in terms of the time scales of the flow, it's instantaneously. And the spatial resolution, that is kind of a disadvantage of cars, the coherent anti Stokes Raman spectroscopy, because uh, in, in our case, um, the, the measurement volume is determined by the crossing of different lasers. That, that, that are needed to create the signal. 
and they have a diameter possibly in the probe volume of 50 microns. However, with our setup, the extension of the car's probe volume is in the order of 500 microns. And this can be done better if you use hybrid cars, but that's nothing we have available. So the disadvantage of this rotational and vibrational cars is the extension of the probe volume in mean laser direction, which in our case is 500 microns. I hope I have answered the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, since time is up, so, so actually we received a lot of questions, almost uh, 20 questions. Oh. We, we cannot <laughs> ask you. So also sorry uh, about that for audience. And uh, so Professor Ju, can, can you say something about uh, Okay, happened? thank you. Uh, and here's is a wonderful talk. You are from canonical diagnostic all the way to the ending application. Fantastic. And I actually have some questions, but I don't have time. I really appreciate that uh, you contribute and then help us for to promote the society. And I would like to everybody turn on your video and uh, so that we have some social time. I would like to uh, to take a, a one moment and to remember that Professor Mario Costa, and I just heard from Victor and one of his collaborator yesterday asking me to share a, uh, a two slide to remember uh, Mario. Uh, Mario was born in 1960s and passed away yesterday. He was professor at the Institute of Super Technology, Lisbon and Portugal. And uh, uh, he has been a, uh, he made a, a significant contribution to combustion areas, uh, organized at the European um, conference and uh, served as uh, many uh, a combustion uh, reviewer panels and also organizing combustion meetings. I just want to take the one moment to, uh, to share our pain and remember our colleagues in this difficult time. And uh, so Victor, do you have anything to share? So actually, uh, I uh, met uh, Mario Costa in uh, 2015 uh, when I was a CSG student. So actually, I'm not so strongly related uh, to his group, but uh, I was uh, shocked by how energetic uh, uh, his person was. So, so actually, he, he was a quite brilliant uh, a scientist and and also quite brilliant uh, 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 person. So, so I'm fortunately I had the opportunity to, to meet uh, him uh, several conferences, and uh, he he always supported me and other young uh, students in combustions to progress, and uh, and highlighted uh, uh, some issues how to improve. And, uh, and he always uh, supported uh, everyone uh, to, to make progress on, on their work. And uh, he, he was quite professional in, uh, in networking. So, uh, so he organized a lot of conferences, not only the mentioned ones, but, uh, but also some, some other uh, smaller and larger conferences as well. Unfortunately, I couldn't find enough uh, data, bibliographic data in the internet, but... Um, but uh, it uh, shows uh, how how uh, big uh, uh, his personality was. Uh, apart from uh, science and the research, uh, in personal life, uh, he was uh, really a, a, a good person, and uh, and uh, seen only the good thoughts. And and uh, he was uh, quite good in in uh, coming over the difficulties and and uh, and uh, managing uh, life. So. So he was uh, quite a uh, person uh, who, who, someone who can learn from. So, so uh, b besides uh, academia, uh, he liked uh, sports very much. So uh, he was a, a, a football out and stick and also ran the half marathon several times, uh, uh, even in the recent years. So, so uh, his physical condition was uh, quite good uh, in, in uh, recently as well. So uh, I, I think that's all. And, and it is quite hard to say so much right now in these difficult times. But uh, probably if, you, if you, some of you know uh, him, uh, uh, you can also share some some thoughts and ideas, because uh, I think uh, uh, we could learn uh, so much from him. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. And, uh, and it's really that uh, a painful time and uh, for the loss of our colleague. And uh, he's very, still very young, energetic, and he could have done a lot of wonderful contribution to our society. Uh, we will remember him. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, and particularly and uh, Professor Dreisler. And I uh, appreciate that uh, your outstanding, inspiring lectures. And uh, I hope to see everybody in the, uh, next week. And uh, this is a wonderful uh, platform for people to connect to each other, and uh, uh, particularly in the difficult time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.